I echo uh, Major Pam's remarks about how good it is to see you. This, this room has been too dark too long, and to see life in this room again is truly a blessing. And so, uh, first, I want to thank uh, Major Doug Rowland for uh, being here and teaching us last week uh, during the Memorial Weekend. The Major Pam and I were spending a couple a couple days off in the Mobile, Alabama with our family, celebrating the birthday of our, our grandson, his second birthday. And so, Major, thank you for your ministry last week, and many of you, I know, saw that. And again, I just want to let you know, remind you, that uh, if you've been watching the, the YouTube or listening to the podcasts of our, of our teaching and the, and the simple services we've been having, they couldn't have taken place without uh, Major Betty Bender and Gene Flegel up in the, in the booth up there. And so... So thank you, and, and I know we're grateful to them for, for really making it happen and, do, and doing their magic. The pandemic of 2020 has been and still is of biblical proportions, isn't it? Apocalyptic, I've heard terms. Um, but someone asked me a few weeks ago, is this God's punishment on us? I don't believe it is. I don't believe God sent uh, the pandemic to us in any kind of judgment. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that has germs, a world that has viruses. And, um, and this one, you know, of course, we know caught us by surprise. As of today, there's no cure. We know that. They're working on a vaccine. Hopefully, there'll be one soon. And still, it's very highly contagious. We can't deny these facts. We can do nothing about that. But as you're doing today, we're all doing today, and thank you for, for bearing with us today. You're, you're doing well at protecting yourselves with the face mask and, and sitting apart from one another and, um, and all the things you've done the past few weeks. We've heard about ways to protect ourselves, and some of these ways might be with us for some time. We don't know. Some are, are simply, quite frankly, a stark reminder of what we maybe should have been doing all along. Uh, the hand washing and maybe the social distancing and things that we've been reminded of and how important they are in this day. Protecting ourselves from people who are sick, washing our hands. Those things are just natural ways of, of, um, of keeping ourselves safe in any kind of a world, even pre-pandemic. But more importantly today, how do we move forward? What have we learned about ourselves during this time, this, this pause, this time of, of being by ourselves in many cases. What, what things have we been able to do without and, and survived or even perhaps thrived in, in changing our routine? Pri priorities may have changed in our lives, maybe temporarily and maybe permanently. How, how can we come out of this time of crisis better people? Can we put into words, can we articulate what we've learned? I'm still working on that myself. Can we articulate about what we've learned about ourselves during this time? Can, can we put into words what we've learned about our church, the church deployed, about, about your own individual ministry, the ministry of our core? It's hard to put these into words, and, and you may still be working on that as, as I am. Well, many of these kindly similar questions were on the minds of a couple million people millennia ago who also had their world turned upside down. As a people, they were at the bottom of the totem pole, the very bottom. Everyone else was above them on this totem pole. They didn't have many choices in life. They were told what to do by others, and that's the life that they lived and life that they knew, the only life that they knew. And even though these people many, many years ago were not in a perfect situation, they knew nothing else. Many were willing even to put up with the frustration and the life situation saying to themselves, well, it could be worse. Exodus talks about those people, the people in Egypt. And Exodus 3, 7 tells us that, that God came down to Moses and says, listen, I've seen the misery of my people. I've heard them crying out. I'm concerned about their suffering. And so because of that, I have come down to rescue them and to bring them up out of this land into a good land that I've promised them. 
And Moses, of course, came on the scene and, and gave God's instructions to the Pharaoh. And Moses said, let my people go. But the Pharaoh, as we all know, wasn't too keen on letting his workforce leave, so the approval for the exodus didn't happen. In fact, he even made God's people's lives worse. Exodus chapter 5, verse 6 to 8 kind of tell us how he reacted. It says, so that same day Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. Life got worse for them when God started to intervene. When God started to work with Moses, things were not better for them initially. And the people were not happy about that. They came to Moses and they said, Moses in chapter 5, verse 21, they said, it's worse for us. It says, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You've made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. These were not happy people. They, they were coming to Moses saying, Moses, this is not working out as you promised us it was going to work out. It's not happening. So we all know this. After the, God sent plagues on the people, on Pharaoh and his household and the, and the Egyptian people there. And after the plagues God sent the Egyptians, he worked out a way for the people of God to relocate out of Egypt. Now, we've all seen the movies. The Red Sea, the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, Moses, as he, in, in perhaps one of the first movies of the, the Ten Commandments, and, and, and we saw him with his rod out over the sea, and, and the Red Sea opened up. And, and most of you probably are, are, know that one, but if there are any younger people, anyone younger people watching, Val Kilmer is the voice of Moses in the Disney animated version of The Prince of Egypt. The same story just animation, and, and we know how the Red Sea opened up and split with Moses holding his rod out there, and the mass of people behind him, and the Egyptians coming over the horizon, and the sea divides, leaving this wall of water on both sides, and the people walk through this narrow area on dry land and to safety. And then the, in, the Egyptian army is pursuing them and the waters come down and consume them and closes upon them just in time. We've all seen that story. We've all read that story. We know it well. A great scene. A great scene in any depiction of the crossing of the Red Sea. What a great expression of God's salvation. What a great expression of God's protection. But when they got over there, in the first few months, they started complaining Exodus chapter 16, verse 3 says, The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, Moses, have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. They were complaining. And they were not happy with this new situation in their life. Chapter 17 of Exodus, verse 3, says this, But the people were thirsty for water there. They grumbled against Moses. They said, Why would you bring us up out of this Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Some of these people genuinely wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to their previous lives, the time when, when they remember the good but forgot the bad, perhaps. But they couldn't because the Red Sea had closed behind them. This was their past. They were now living in a new normal. You and I are living in a new normal, aren't we? The pandemic's not over, even though we're sitting here, as evidenced by your face mask and sitting apart. The pandemic is still out there. Late last week, I listened to the, the sheriff of Pinellas County. He said that although the curve in this county is flat, there's still about 15 to 17 new cases diagnosed every day in our county. It's low, but it's not gone. Testing's moving forward. When Major Pam and I were coming back from Alabama, there was a blockade at the Florida border on I-10. And we all had to get, all of us in the cars had to get off the highway. And we were asked, as we stopped there, we were asked by the officials, in the last 14 days, have you been to New York, New Jersey, I believe Connecticut, and Louisiana? 
and luckily we had not, and so they let us go. But it looked like there may have been testing sites there for those who may have been in these places. It's still a very real pandemic. It's not over. And, and the testing's moving forward. They're still working on a vaccine, and they'll find one. But we need to keep practicing our social distancing. We keep to, need to keep wearing our face masks in public. I visited a mall not long ago in, in Tampa, actually. There was a business there, and the food court was amazing because you know how food courts are, the little tables with people all around them. There, this is a picture of it here because there was one table with one chair and then another 20 feet, another table with one chair. I mean, what kind of a food court is that? And it hit me, things are different. Things may not get back to the same. You and I may want to go back. In our humanness, we may want to go back to pre-pandemic. We may want to go back to a hug and a handshake and a pat on the back, things that you and I have enjoyed. We want to go back to fellowshipping with family and friends closely, intimately around our dining room tables. We want to go back to crowded restaurants and fellowshipping in the lobby after church. We want to go back to having friends and family in our homes for dinner. And it's very possible that we may start seeing new laws in our country of construction and commerce that don't allow three sinks in the public bathroom next to each other. If you've been here, you'll notice our center sinks are blocked off. There may be laws that, pre that, that prevent us from doing that. Less seating in theaters, less seating in classrooms, less seating in sports arenas, less seating in concert halls and churches. We've come through this perhaps, but we have made adjustments in our lives, but the waters have closed behind us, haven't they? And we can't realistically go back. We may want ways to be the way they were in our church in our worship, in our personal lives, in our public interaction with others, but this may not be. We don't know, but this may not be. The waters have closed. We live in a new normal now. And in, in our private thoughts, and this is something I'm grappling with in my own mind, we, we may lament the losses of our normal way of life. There may be times of introspection when we look back and say, I wish the those days were here. There, there may be times of a very private, very deep grief that we may experience knowing we can't go back. Maybe feelings of sadness or melancholy may seem to come from nowhere. This may be the source of them knowing that the waters have come back together and we can't go back. And these are very human feelings, very human emotions. Let them go where they will because we are trying to deal with that, each of us, in our own individual ways. But, no matter how you're feeling, no matter what melancholy may come, no matter what frustration may come, even if we lament the past, we can remember forever that life happens and God is there. And for the people of Israel, life happened and God was there. He never left them. And, and life was not easy for the people in the desert those many years ago. Food was scarce. Water was hard to come by. It was hard to find grazing land for their animals. They lived in tents that had to be taken down and put up as they moved around the desert there. And some went back to worshiping false idols. Some lost their faith in Moses and God. Sometimes God was angry at their rebellion and lack of faith, but he never forsook them, did he? Exodus 15 tells us when they came to an area where water was bitter, God provided a way to provide the water sweet for them. Exodus 16 says when they complained about not having bread and protein, that it literally rained down from heaven, this stuff called manna. And the scripture says at twilight you will eat meat, quail. In the morning you'll be filled with bread, manna in the afternoon. It was kind of like they said, the Bible says, a white coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. That sounds good. And, and in Exodus 17, they needed water to drink. And they came to Moses, and, and God led Moses to a rock. And at that time, he hit the rock, and water gushed out. God never left the people, even in the wilderness. And through their 40 years of meandering, God had to remind them what he had done for us. And this is kind of the, the stone upon which we build our thoughts this morning. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt 
and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. God has and God continues to carry you and to me on eagle's wings and protecting us and being with us. He has never left you and never left me. These past two and a half months have not been easy. Following orders for safer at home have not been easy. Not being able to go out like we want to around town as we've done before has not been easy. Some of you here or maybe some watching or listening have not been able to go to work, make a living. Some, some have been laid off, put on furlough. Some are still facing financial hardships, not of your own making. Some of you have had a hard time finding food you needed or toilet paper. What is it with toilet paper? I think it's out there now, but for a while there, there was none. Many of our freedoms that we've enjoyed our whole lives have been taken away for our safety and the safety of others. And although we are grateful that we've heard about no one in our congregation here who has, has been tested positive for the coronavirus, and we're thankful for that, there may be some who are watching, some who are listening, who may have tested positive and are grappling with that. We may know people who have had the virus. We've had extended family members who have had the virus and survived. Some of us may have known people who have passed away from the virus. But in speaking to many of you, I hear you saying, God has been faithful. I hear you saying, He's watched over me. I hear you saying, all of our needs were met. Some have told us that this, this pause has afforded us the time to read more about the Lord. This pause has given us the time to spend more time in His Word, to spend more time in prayer, to be more reflective. Now, you've heard this story if you've been reading our uh, emails that went out, but I, I, I just want to share it with you again in case maybe you hadn't. There was a London transit strike years ago, and the subway stations were closed, and there was chaos, people trying to find their way to work and school, and people had to find new ways to get around the city. It was chaotic. It was stressful. It was annoying. And, and people found out ways to get around it without the transit system being in full operation. And when the strike was over, it was expected everyone would return to their regular commutes they had prior to the strike. But re researchers found out that wasn't the case. They found out that thousands of people in London had stuck with the new routines they had invented during the strike and felt no need to go back before because they had learned ways of doing things that they found out were better. The chaos had helped people identify new and better ways of doing things. And perhaps that's been your experience. Perhaps even though many of our plans have been upended, even though our routines of life and rhythms have changed a bit and, and the way forward is unclear to you and me, we've had an opportunity to look at the world through new eyes, haven't we? We see things differently. We experience things differently. We react differently. But there may be things that you have done differently. You may say, you know, I think it's going to work. I think I'll stick with that. And just like God reminded his people long ago, we can testify to the fact that God carried us on eagle's wings and brought him us to himself what a great opportunity you and I have to testify to his provisions and many of you have been doing that we've been hearing the stories even during this time of uncertainty God has never turned his back on you God has never turned his back on us yes life happens but God is there Back to our story in Exodus, some 40 years later, Moses has died, and now Joshua is leading the next generation of God's people. They've come to another insurmountable barrier, the wide Jordan River, in flood stage, overflowing its banks. And in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, it's interesting because God says here, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. God is saying to the people, listen, get yourselves ready spiritually, because watch God's going to do something for you that you will not imagine. And then God gives some very strange instructions to Joshua to give to the people carrying the Ark of the Covenant, actually. In chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge 
of Jordan's waters doesn't say stop. It doesn't say wait. It says go and stand in the river. Wouldn't you hate to be that first one? The first one there, wouldn't you hate to be that person? Go, just keep on marching. You and I need to keep on marching. We don't need to wait for things to open up for us. I think God wants us to move forward in our lives. We can lament the past, but God's not calling us to stay there. He wants us to move forward into, yes, an unknown future, whatever is held for us. Another command from God. Another command from God. It's interesting because last week, if you saw the video, Major uh, Roland spoke on this, this very, very topic, and I think it's very appropriate in both situations, Memorial Weekend as well as why we're here today. And so I think uh, the Lord led it on my heart to present it, and so he must have us to present it twice. So thank you, Major, for presenting that. Joshua chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, instructions to the people of Israel. Choose 12 men from among the people one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stand. As the Major mentioned last week, these were huge boulders, and these representatives carry these huge boulders on their shoulders across the river and place them and stack them up on the, on the dry shore of the Jordan River. Now, if you're a Michigander, you've may probably been to Mackinac Island, and we go there every summer. It's a great place to be. And on Mackinac Island, if you take the, the, the one road around the island, you will see stones stacked up. We've got a couple pictures, I think, of those. They're called cairns. It's, it's uh, C-A-I-R-N, cairn. And people will stack these stones up in different ways. In fact, on the uh, Courtney Campbell Causeway, if you take a bike down there, there's cairns along there, too, because there's a lot of rocks there on the edge. People will make cairns. They'll stack up these stones. And there's no real significance. It's not a spiritual thing other than saying, hey, I was here. I stacked these stones. And other passerbys may get a smaller stone and put it on top and see how high they And if you look, if you Google stone stacking, there's some very elaborate ones that seem to defy gravity that people make. But people will add to them. Or maybe if you see a Karen and make one, you'll come back to it later and add to it. So these are Karens. I think of Karens when I think of, of Joshua and the stones stacked on the edge of the Jordan River. Perhaps the first Karen ever was in the Scripture here. Stones being stacked next to the river. But why were they to do this, as the major reminded us last week? Not to say, I was here, but to say, remember. Look at this passage, Joshua chapter 4, starting at verse 6. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel together. The Karen that was built, a huge Karen on the side of the Jordan River, was there to remember. And when the grandkids and the kids would say, what's that pile of stones mean? The people were to say, that's when God took care of us. That's when God protected us. It, and it wasn't simply to say, I was there. But God, that is to say, life happened, but God was there. A way to testify that those rocks represented God's presence. Today, we've got some Karen stones for you. They're in the back. They're nothing as big as the ones in Israel because you wouldn't want to carry them on your shoulders. But these are going to be given to you if you choose to take one as a reminder of what the Lord has done for you through these days. He's brought you through these days. He continues to bring you through these days. And we would suggest, if you get to have a Sharpie, you can write on them maybe a word that represents what God has done for you these two and a half months. Perhaps words like peace or comfort or time, pause, maybe reboot, simplicity, priorities, family, reconnect. Still, breathe. You know the word. You can, whatever God has spoken to you, you can write it on your, your Karen stone if you choose to. And then, perhaps, you want to place this maybe on your counter at home. Maybe carry it in your pocket. And when your grandchildren come to visit you and they say, 
Grandma, Grandpa, what's that stone mean? You can say, let me tell you about the stone of remembrance. Let me tell you what God did for me those two and a half to three months during that pandemic of 2020. And you can share with people that come to visit you, yes, life happened, but God was there. That's the promise of today. We're going to listen to a, see a video, a very, very brief video here, um, Amazing Grace. And during this time of doing so, let's just spend this time in quiet contemplation, reflection, prayer. I mean, these can still be used and keep social distancing if you feel the need to come down here. And let's just spend a few moments as we think of ourselves and reminded the grace that God's provided for you and for me during these days. 